So what I want to do is kind of give you an idea of how when you diagnose somebody's sexual function now, when you understand what their sexual function is, and they come in and say you're treating. Now I know most people in the room probably aren't the primary person treating somebody's sexual dysfunction. You're here more because you want to learn about it. But if you are treating somebody's sexual concerns after spinal cord injury, what I want to talk about now is kind of how you could model this treatment. Um, and uh, the, the woman with uh, the, the pelvic floor rehab, um, you know, how you could kind of use this to track how somebody's um, therapy is. And I just would comment one of the um, pretty girls in the sixth row there is a physical therapist that does a lot of pelvic floor therapy. And I think that's, a, you know, that's an important aspect for people, especially if they had incomplete injuries. So here we are. There's two topics I'm going to talk about here. And these are called the autonomic standards and the international data sets and how we can use those to manage sexual concerns after spinal cord injury. Now, when I have all this, this slide here, I have all these follow-ups, follow-up, 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 educate, neuro exam. So we can talk to people about sex, but we need to put it down on paper so that we remember what was happening before and we figure out if it's a problem for the person or not. The interesting thing about sex that I learned when I did um, the Viagra study was, you know, we couldn't just take women with spinal cord injuries and say, oh, let's give you Viagra and see if you get better. You can't treat people's sexual dysfunction unless there's a big word there, and that's distress. It's not considered sexual dysfunction unless it bothers you. So we go back to our neurologic exam, and excuse my lines that move to the wrong place, but we got our belly button to our pockets, right? And we know, we see the patient, we know, for instance, they're like a high para, and they have, you know, sen they have no sensation from the belly buttons to pockets. Then we're going to say, oh, they don't have psychogenic lubrication or erection, right? Because when they have no sensation here, you don't have the psychogenic. But then they would have reflex because they're hyperreflexic because of their injury, and they should potentially have orgasms. Okay, so we know that from just seeing the person. So where do we put that? Well, we put some information on the International Standard, Standards Form, but there's a kind of a hole in the International Standards Form. And that hole, and this is an old form, it's not a, not a new one because the new one's a little more uh, detailed, but it does not have the bulbocavernosis reflex. So we got to get our information and we have to record it somewhere. And we use our injury first to predict responsiveness. We look if there, as I said, if it was a upper motor neuron injury, if it's incomplete, the ability to have psychogenic function, no matter where your injury is, is related to that belly button to the pockets. And anybody with an upper motor neuron injury should be able to have an orgasm and reflex arousal. The people with the lower motor neuron injury, so these are people that have like cauda equina injuries or injuries below T12, and some people that have um, anterior horde syndromes where they just injure the front part of their spinal cord. Some of those people don't have any reflexes. But the people that have lower motor neuron injuries also have the same thing. Belly button to pockets. The more sensation between the belly button and the pockets, the more chance there is for psychogenic arousal. The people that have incomplete injuries that are lower motor neuron injuries, they have potential to have orgasm. Um, but the people with complete lower motor neuron injuries are less likely to have orgasms. So I know this is what's supposed to happen. So if somebody comes and sees me, and I'm looking at them, I got to start figuring out, OK, well, that's their potential. You know, according to what I know, this person should be able to have orgasms. Why don't they have orgasms? Or this person should be able to have lubrication. Why don't they have lubrication? And how do we discuss that? And so a big part of what um, we've done internationally, and we're still working to get this out there because things take time, is we did develop back in 2009, we published these international standards to document remaining autonomic function after spinal cord injury. And 
there is a component in terms of this, and it's particularly in terms of sexual function, and it documents the reported impact of injury on sexual response. Psychogenic arousal, reflex arousal, ejaculation, orgasm, and somehow we put in their menses too. So, um, although I'm not talking about reproduction so much, I'm talking about sex. So, what you do on this form, this autonomic standards form, how many of you have ever seen this or heard of this? One, woo, we got a lot of work to do. Um, what you can do on this form is you document on here what's present. Does the person have genital arousal? And if so, do they have psychogenic and do they have reflex arousal? Do they have orgasms, ejaculation, and menses sensation? I told you this one wasn't going to be entertaining. Um, what you do, though, is you remember how you do the neurologic exam for sensation? We made it the same way. So zero means no function, one means partial function, different than normal, and two means normal function. So ideally what's happening is we're using this form, and on the same part of the form, there's a section for urinary tract function and bowel function too. So we have all the sacral autonomic function here together, and we are revising this form now, and so um, I would like this to go along with the international standards form so we have all this information together because the fact that it's a separate form is makes people use it less. But all that information there is um, important to the person. We all want to get better. Um, there is not as much research looking at recovery of these functions as there is you know, recovery of motor function. And you, know, you want your bladder and your bowel to work and your sexual function to work. So how do we coordinate these findings then? You know, I've told you what I think should happen. And then we have reality. What does the person have? You know, the person doesn't know anything about all these reflexes or whatever, but you're going to try to help them. So what do you do? You look, you get your doctor to examine your patient, or if you're a doctor, you do the exam. You did a general examination. You do the international standards exam, and you pay attention to the belly button to the pockets and the sacral area. So the area, S3, is the area where you sit on your your ischial tuberosities and S4-5 is the anal area. You're doing your anal sensation, checking that reflex there to see if there's a bulbocavernosis reflex, to see if the person has a reflex response. And then you use those findings to determine what you think should happen sexually with your patient. And you do this autonomic standards, and this is uh, all detailed writing here, but basically you're looking at do they have arousal? Is it psychogenic? Is it reflex? Do they have orgasms? For men, we also ask, do they have ejaculation? For women, they also, um, we talk about menses. And then we say, OK, this is what Barbara has, but really Barbara should have this. This is what John has, but really John has this. If they have a difference and the person cares about it, then they have a problem. If they have a difference and they don't care about it, then there's not a problem, obviously. So we use the autonomic standards as a way to talk about what person's going on, what's going on with the person. But then there's another aspect of, that we can use, and those are called the data sets. And the data sets are actually um, available for not just sexual function, but there are data sets for spinal cord injury for lots of different functions. And um, Dr. Bryce, I think, actually did the data set for pain after spinal cord injury. So um, I led the data sets for sexual function. And this is really a way to document what's going on with the person with a spinal cord injury if you're treating them in an ongoing fashion. So you can use this mechanism to document in the medical record what's going on. And you could put it in EPIC or whatever system you use. And there's other important questions, though, in the data set that we realize we need to address, too. I mean, I'm talking, I'm focusing on sexual response right now, but there's all the other aspects of life we have to think about. So what else does it talk about? Sexual orientation whether the patient wants to talk about sex. Not everybody wants to talk about sex. Um, and um, is it really a dysfunction? And this is my slide, um, my hot slide. Um, 
This is from Push Girl, so um, I haven't really, I don't watch TV much, but I thought it was a great slide, and I think it's a good, um, good little bit of changing the media aspect in terms of looking at um, persons with disabilities. And this is the female sexual function um, form. And this was just actually finished uh, very recently, like it's not published yet. It's on the websites. It's not published in an article format yet. But I'm gonna go through this piece by piece. I'm gonna make it a little easier. What you do is you take the date, you say what date you're seeing the patient, and then the first thing is, do they wanna talk to you about sex? And it may be no. Or it may be, yes, they want to talk about sex and you're going to work on them and that sort of thing. Or it can be yes, um, or no, they don't want to talk about sex um, at all. Wait, let me, let me start back. Yes, they want to talk about sex. Yes, but they only want to answer questions. They don't want anything else to do with it. They're not interested in like moving ahead or no. And then the um, issue comes up is sexual orientation. And we just added sexual orientation um, this year. We didn't have it listed previously as a variable, so we have, um, after much discussion, came up with the orientation variables of heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual or lesbian, asexual, preferred not to say, and do not know. And that's a new variable. Then we have the issue of their sexual problems before the spinal cord lesion. And this, again, this is an important question because there's so many reasons you can have sexual problems. And in my last les lesson, I'm gonna kind of go all over that, my last lecture, I'll go over all that. But there's so many reasons. Diabetes, high blood pressure, medications you take, maybe you just never had good sexual function, maybe you had a problem you know, your whole life, maybe you were going through a divorce, maybe, you know, all these things can be there beforehand. So if you had problems before, um, the issue is yes, if you do, specify it. And remember, that's your red flag that says, outside therapist, outside therapist, you're not gonna be able to handle this yourself. Then we go to what we've been talking about more, and that's sexual dysfunction related to the spinal cord lesion. And if there's a problem there, and they say it's a dysfunction, right, as opposed to a change in how they're functioning, then you're hopefully gonna work to treat. And those are the people we wanna help. Then the last areas we look at is what the, what the autonomic standards is doing. We just wanna document the status. Do they have psychogenic arousal? Do they have reflex arousal? Do they have orgasms? And in women, do they have periods? So all these things, we go through this, and then we, we know in the record what's going on. We do a similar logic for female data sets. Is there anybody in the room that doesn't think this guy is hot? <laughs> there's, this, um, there's this website called Streetsy. <laughs> and I just love this picture. Um, if you go to Streetsy, they have like incredible images and I just think this is such a wonderful picture. So with men, we use similar logic as for women for the data sets and the standards. And here's the data sets. Um, I do the same thing? No, I didn't. So with the data sets with men, you know, we're asking the questions. Do you want to talk about sex? Yes, I just, I'll, I'll give you my answers to the questions, but I don't need your help. Go away. Or no, you know, the different options. And then we do sexual orientation. Um, the only difference here is we have homosexual gay with this one. Um, then we ask again sexual problems prior to the injury. Did they have erectile dysfunction before their injury? Were they taking Viagra before their injury? Um, are they, you know, are they on SSRIs? Were they having issues prior to the injury? Did they have premature ejaculation before? Um, and then those would be the people you refer. And then sexual dysfunction related to the injury. Is this a problem for them? Do they need treatment? Big, important questions we need to ask and figure out, because not everybody cares. And then the last part of this is, and um, the last part is, you know, the same thing of, do they have psychogenic erections, belly button to pockets? Do they have reflex erections? Do they have sacral reflexes? Do they have hyperreflexia there? Do they have ejaculations? And I'll take a little, 
I'll talk a bit here about ejaculation. There is a group of men that have a problem having ejaculation after spinal cord injury and have a real hard time with the ejaculatory stimulation techniques. And those are the men with lesions in the thoracolumbar area, kind of the same thing with the psychogenic area around that T12, L1 area. Those people are less likely to have responses in terms of ejaculatory stimulation from just using the vibrators and that sort of thing. And it's... Um, Actually, there's a couple studies that are really good, and if you want to learn about this, there's a guy, I'll spell his name for you, it's C-H-E-H-E-N-S-E-E. -E -E. And um, it's a sad story, because he's apparently, he was a young physiatrist in France, and he did a really good meta-analysis looking at all the ejaculation studies in spinal cord injury, and he showed that really that T11 to L2 area there um, is kind of where, if that, in, if that area is out, then you don't have ejaculations. And there is, um, scientifically, there's a, what they found is that there is a human spinal ejaculator. Um, what they, well, they found was first they found evidence of a spinal ejaculator in rats, and that was published back out in the, um, about 10 years ago or so. And his his research actually said, okay, well, there's, this should be the location for the human spinal ejaculator. And then the next thing he did, which was really cool, was they did a study, this is bad to say it was cool, all right, it wasn't, it, okay, don't think I'm morbid, they took, um, they did autopsies. They took humans with autopsies, both males and both females, and they looked at their spinal cords, and they did find the specific type of chemical that would be made at this ejaculation center in male and female um, bodies. So they actually showed some evidence of this ejaculation generator in, in humans. And I was like really fascinated with this doctor. I was like going to write to him and I'm editing a journal and I was going to ask him if he would speak at this course I'm putting together. And then I found out he died in a scuba diving accident this year or last year. So he would have been a great um, leader in the field of sexuality. But the area that we're talking about then with that this ejaculation generator is kind of like um, in the thoracolumbar area, and people that have lesions in that particular area have a harder time using the vibratory stimulation for fertility, um, and and that so that's a little side point here that I would just want to make. Um, and then so we had ejaculation, and then we have orgasmic function. Again, they're not the same. While I'm here, I'm, I know I don't talk about it in my other uh, talk, and I think I have a couple minutes, right? One minute. One minute. One minute, sorry. Um, just the whole thing of dysreflexia. Dysreflexia can occur with sexual activity. It's more common with the, with the stimulation of ejaculation. And when people do stimulate ejaculation, they generally try to prophylax. You know, there's two ways we stimulate ejaculation. One is through the vibratory stimulation. Um, this is kind of before you get to the... the um, ICSI and those other techniques, and then people also do the electro ejaculation. And basically, in electro ejaculation, they stimulate through the rectum in the area, it's kind of in the area of the prostate, and that causes an ejaculation for people. But when you do those techniques, it generally does increase the blood pressure relatively significantly, kind of like 180 over 100 and that sort of thing. And those type of procedures, they usually prophylax again. When I talk about dysreflexia, I mean, you know, most people when they're having sex at home are not getting dysreflexic. Um, and I say that just because I had 100 people with vibrators in the lab and I didn't see anybody get dysreflexic. But if they do have a problem, by sh certainly you need to educate them at T6 and above and say, you know, this could happen. We don't think it's going to happen. If you have a bad headache when you're having sex, stop. I don't want anybody to get, you know, hurt. And then and I would say stop and go to your doctor, tell them about it, make sure you don't have a urinary tract infection, which could be the other things causing dysreflexia. And then they, you can give people medicine to prevent that when they're sexually active. Um, generally, that might be nitropaste, which I like because you can wipe it off, but it could also be um, other medications. And that's all I'll say now, and we'll do some more fun stuff after lunch.